So for folks who are here the first time, this is San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm Eve, your teacher for the evening, and this is your community for the evening. How wonderful. So this is an entirely volunteer run center. So meaning we literally exist here because of the generosity of everybody who's in this room and has come before. We have our wonderful volunteers who support this space. And in the well of being Wednesdays, what we often do is we follow a book and we do meditations related to some of the practices in the book. We follow the theme through discussion. We completed a book last week. It was so beautiful. So we are this week, it's going to be um, not part of a series, but we will still engage in meaningful connection and discussion. It's such an essential part of these teachings is to be able to be here together, <clears throat> both in person and online, and not just listen and receive, which is nice, but to engage and consider to kind of do that healthy level of agitation. Like, what is this? What does it mean? Right? I think I am not a um, physiotherapist, but I think there's a little level of agitation that helps us build muscle. And similarly, for these teachings to come alive, we have to kind of try them on, like bend them a little. Uh, one of the famous teachings of the Buddha, he was visiting these towns throughout India. This is before he was pretty well known. And at this time in India, there were many teachers who would come and visit, <clears throat> who said they were awakened, who had these practices. And so he visited this town and the inhabitants of the town were like, yeah, huh, you you got some dharma, huh? You're awakened, okay. <laughs> Sounds likely. Yeah. And, um, and he invited them. He said, you know, trust your own experience. You know, come and see yourself. And then he had this beautiful image of, you know, test to see if it is gold for you. Burn it, you know, beat on it, like see its pliability, right? And um, we're not going to burn anything or beat anything up tonight. Um, but we are going to kind of challenge these ideas and questions uh, and how they apply to our life. We're going to focus on self compassion tonight. Oh, man. Like lifetimes worth of training needed ahead for me, at least. Um, and I hope for all of you, you'll feel like you get some uh, refreshment or benefit from it. I bet many people in the room have tried it at least once. Uh, and we had a little bit of a conversation. Is this seat open? Okay, great. There's one back there next to Sissy. Yes. Actually, how much more do we have to slide? Like, we'll have the door. Any more? Any more? Two over there. Two over there. Great. Can, are there any more cushions to put on the floor in case? No, but they can. I have a cushion that I'm using. I can give it up. Okay. Great. Okay. We have more in the library. Okay. Should we, we should bring them out if we think someone, but it's, I don't know. Maybe one or two. That's the library. Got it. Yeah, and I know it looks like hot lava on the floor, but you can actually sit there. No, no big deal. Um, for anyone who's interested, they can definitely do that um, or change back and forth. So yeah, so it's important to us as we come together just for this evening. Um, again, if this is the only time you come, how wonderful. We're so grateful to have you. If you come all the time, so wonderful to have you as part of the weave of our community. And important when we come together and discuss is that we do so like in accordance with the Dharma. So when we are conversing with one another, when we are listening with one another, we really take this ethos of non-harming. How can I, in what I'm listening and how I'm listening and how can and the way I'm speaking be the least harming, the most compassionate? So the practice is a definite important time for us to deepen those qualities, but just as important as, as how we show up here in community. If we don't have that, it's really hard for us to connect with one another. So I just want to really make that explicit that, yes, there will be some conversation. It will be an opportunity to like look face to face with your judgment um, and hopefully find some, some pliancy and some ability to feel compassion. Because each of us here, contributes to each of us moving forward on our path like not one person less it really is important that all of us are here and so to really kind of hold that sense of 
um, honoring one another in person and online. So with that, I'd like us to do a, a dropping in practice first, then I'll do a little discussion. We'll do another practice, a little more discussion. And for folks, especially if it's your first time, you know, new spaces can be a little bit funny. So take your time to look around the room and just kind of see the contours of the room. Um, there is this entrance in front. We have Mace, who is our fearless protector at the door. So we are safe, relatively speaking, from outer harms. You know, the inner harms, we're going to try to be safe from those, mm -hmm. cultivating compassion. And yeah, just give yourself a moment to really settle into this space. You're welcome to have your eyes slightly open or closed, whatever supports your practice in the best way. Posture always is so important. It's a signal to the mind and to the heart and the body that something important is happening. When we arrange and align our posture, we can imagine these two qualities coming together. One is a quality of just uprightness and vividness. We could imagine this like the, the trunk of a very tall tree, so rooted. Mm. We can rely on that stability, that upwardness reaching up towards the sky. And we also want to invite this other complementary quality, that feeling almost like a river of flow through the face and the chest and the belly, just this ease of movement, the undulations of energy in the body freely flowing. And so a couple of breaths here on the inhale, finding that length, that verticality, that vividness. And on the exhale, the softening, the releasing, flowing. And as we arrive here, taking a moment to notice what's here in the body with us. What might be the imprint or resonance from the day? Maybe there's some common holding patterns we recognize, but be curious and explore what are all the different tactile experiences in the body. We're going to shift our attention and awareness from the body and sensation to the mind and imagination, doing a retrospective awareness of our day. And so taking a moment and with our memory and imagination, can you remember the very first thing that you saw when you woke up this morning and your eyes open? What was the quality of light or darkness in the room? What were the first thoughts? What were the feelings in the body or maybe even emotions about the day ahead or the dreams that had passed? And then moving ahead in time to some point in your morning, maybe you had a, a hot caffeinated or otherwise beverage. Maybe you were moving fast and getting out the door. Maybe you had some time for rest, but choose just one moment. And just like a snapshot, can you recall what was going on around you? What were you seeing, hearing? What were you thinking and feeling?
moving forward in the day, sometime around a midday point. Maybe you were alone or with others at work or otherwise. Likely there were many moments, choose just one. And again, like this snapshot, regathering and recollecting our attention and awareness from this earlier part of the day. What were you seeing? What were you hearing? And can you recall what it felt like in your body? And what emotions may have been present? No need to analyze or fix or change this moment in the day, just to kind of refreshing our awareness and attention, recognizing, regathering, an understanding of this day which has passed. And then moving ahead in time to at some point in the afternoon as you were making your way here, whether by bicycle or by foot, by car or bus, do you remember getting on your journey on your way here? What were you seeing, feeling, thinking? And then moving ahead in time to when you first walked in the door here. What did you see or feel? What did you hear? What did you notice? When moving ahead in time to this moment, all the accumulation of moments which have already populated this day, the heart, the mind, and the body. Be curious with a fresh curiosity. What's here now? What's in the body? What's in the heart? What's in the mind? And with some gentleness, we may notice what is here that might feel a little hard? What is here that we feel we're kind of holding up? Make space for that too. Keep noticing, keep refreshing. It's a full entry into the presence of this moment with this body, this heart, this mind. And it keeps changing. Sounds arise, sensations arise. Thoughts arise. Just keep noticing a bit longer. Saturating ourselves with this presence 
of what's here. Without changing anything, is it possible to notice that the quality of our awareness and attention being right here, there's something implicitly, maybe explicitly, kind? Just giving ourselves this space to be with ourselves. Is there a kindness here? being with our full attention and awareness what's happening moment to moment so not shifting anything but just maybe having that resonance with the potential and possibility of the kindness that's always already here Welcome again, all of you, which is here. We haven't done that practice in a while, the retrospective awareness. It can be a really nice way to um, arrive and to really kind of, you know, take stock a bit of, of where we've been in the day and really get a sense of what we're carrying. Sometimes with that practice, I notice, especially if I do it even you know, longer, like more chapters of the day, then my head and my body are like not even in the same place for most of it. Like I know what I was thinking, but I have no idea what's happening in my body. Or there's some difficulty in my body, but I have no idea what I'm thinking. Um, I'm curious, yeah, if folks had any questions or reflections on that practice. For friends in the room, we use this mic um, not to just be awkward on the spot in the middle of the room, but also so that folks at home can hear us, um, but it's not amplified. So any questions or reflections on that practice? Anything you noticed about doing that retrospective awareness for the day? Yes, please. Today, I, I rode my bike to the um, the center, and you know, going back through that, I just realized how tense I am when I'm on the bike, mm. um, and I don't feel like it when I'm during it. But I was just, you know, I can feel myself just gripping. I was like, oh wow. But part of it's because I'm, you know, being mindful of all the cars around me. But I was just like. I didn't realize until I was doing it right now that I was at yeah like, almost no, uh, white knuckling yeah and I was like wow that's a lot of tension in the yeah. Back, right yeah thank you for that noticing yeah and did it feel like it released when you noticed it here it, 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 sorry it, 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 it felt like in my meditation I was like I can relax because you know I'm not gonna get hit by by a car. Um, so it, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, so well, right? Like the body holds, right? Um, so great that you had that insight around it and that we could even still be holding it here and not aware, right? Like that cumulative tension. So giving ourselves that space for things to kind of pass through. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other, yes, please. I know it's so far back there. You're very good. Thanks. 
Get your steps in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll just say it was really interesting because I vividly remember when I woke up this morning having a sense, subtle but very real sense of dread about the day. Uh, big dread. Dread, D R E A D. You. And, you know, and it's just because I was like, this is going to be a tough day. Yeah. There's a lot going on. It's going to be really hard to keep up with everything. And what was fascinating was that I, I you know, remembered having that. Um, and, you know, but I didn't think to reflect on it until we did our guided meditation. And I was like, oh, it actually was a really good day. Hmm. So it took a 180. I mean, it was hard, but it was like good. Yeah. And so I think it was just a good reminder that like a lot of it is just sort of the anticipation of what's yeah. going to happen. And then, you know, if I can recognize that in real time, that like, look, you know, right now I might be sort of experiencing this, but after the fact or during the fact it might not be as bad than that. Right. Be helpful. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think, you know, the like, who woke up with a little bit of dread this morning? Let's be real. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Not great, but we're in it together. Um, and some of it can help, right? It's like, okay, like I need to prepare. Like there's things I need to do. I'm not going to lay in bed. But, you know, I love what you're highlighting, which is, you know, it actually wasn't that bad. And I don't know, like, how how unpleasant was the dread in terms of, like, the rest of, like, was it a pretty unpleasant feeling? It was just like, oh, boy, we, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. This, yeah. This, let's, let's, you know, just kind of suck it up and, and let's yeah. get through it. Yeah. Uh, but then it actually was, it was, there were flavors of that, yeah. but, like, there was, it was, like, way better than I thought it was going to be. So. Great. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And I. I think it's interesting because it can be that when we wake up, we're really looping, um, you know, especially if we woke up earlier than we wanted or, you know, there's other um, contingencies happening and we can get pretty caught from the get go of the day in this kind of something's wrong, you know, like this isn't be hard. It's bad. And we're just like in that um, kind of pattern without a lot of thought about it. So it's great to recognize now, like, yeah, it was okay. And at some point in the day, letting go and being like, oh, it's okay. It's good. Yeah. We were talking earlier, a group of us, you know, in terms of my colleagues in behavioral science, one thing we really come back to over and over is how precious the beginning and the end of the day are mm -hmm. for setting new habits. Right. And like really, you know, getting familiar with them. And that could be like checking in first thing in the morning. What is my perspective of how this day is going to be? Okay. Like it's dread, but is maybe something else also true. Right. And, you know, you could set an intention or even just a consideration of this could also be a day where I'm extra compassionate to myself because it's going to be such a hard day. And then at the end of the day, it can be really nice to reflect on, you know, maybe places where we could have had more compassion for ourselves, not in a beating yourself up way, but just in a letting that release, you know, like Ulysses was saying, the release of the of the body, but there can also be the release of, I was holding so much tension about how hard it would be, and it's okay, and I did it, and I'm good. I'm just really letting that full um, space for our experience to move through. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. So for me, I noticed that there were, there were all these different really interesting moments throughout the day and some of them I was really present for and others I noticed oh I wasn't really that yeah. present for that moment and there were these really beautiful moments that I was like oh wow that was such a really great moment to have and I didn't really it wasn't there for it mm -hmm. when it was happening so I thought that was really cool yes very good noticing yeah, yeah. and where were you when you weren't in the good moment Sorry, say it again. Where were you when you weren't in, inhabiting your good moment? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> or maybe I just didn't notice the, how good it was. Yeah. Maybe I was there, but I wasn't really appreciating it for what it was or yeah. 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 Distracted. It's, yeah. And this is, things. you know, it's interesting. I do think this practice, you know, you could do it. Let's say you do it for a week. My strong assumption, no data to back this up, is it would really improve our mindfulness during the day. Mm. Even though it's retrospective, it would bring that sense during the day of, oh, am I here? I noticed it, and I'm not. Am I here? Am I enjoying this moment? Where am I? You know, just that practice. And I'm looking at some data right now from a bigger study where we had folks, you know, reflect on their emotions and mood every day. 
And then after they'd done this for a whole year, kind of tell us about how was that for you or what was it like? And a lot of people said just that everyday check-in once a day, reflecting on the whole day could be very, um, very transformative to just be like, yeah, really, I don't even think about how I'm feeling. Sometimes I don't even know how I'm feeling. And that practice and process can kind of tie us in, bring us home. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great. And I'm curious about the hard part. Is anyone able to recognize? I don't know if you could tie that in, Chris, to your comment. What, like the Okay, good. Oh, I got you with hard parts. Good, thank you. <laughs> um, so for me, it's a matter of, you know, this morning I noticed that I had dropped my sunglasses. Mm. And I noticed that. It's like, oh, good Chris, paying attention. Didn't lose sunglasses. Mm -hmm. And then within like a half hour, I'm home, I got my groceries, I put my bike in, I left the groceries on the, you know, sidewalk. My neighbor's dog knocks over my groceries and breaks exactly the cost of the sunglasses. Aww. So, uh, so, so then I got to go, okay, so this is actually a chance to practice the non-attachment. <laughs> and, you know, it was just like a total wash. Yeah. I got my sunglasses, but I lost my grocery. Yeah. And did you feel that when you got here into the room, like the heart, like the last instruction um, I was asking folks, or I can just ask folks generally, like when you're, we are here in this moment, present with ourselves. Did folks recognize there's something hard to be with here? Yeah. Did anyone not find something that was hard to be with? Yeah, and that's not like just a self-selecting group of people who meditate have hard stuff, right? It is all of us and we don't always make space for it. So not only are we not making space maybe throughout the day for what we're feeling and experiencing, but then um, even in our practice, we can kind of you know, think that the practice is a way to kind of ameliorate, but that, and that can be true, but there's a way of like the including and the welcoming that can be so helpful. And it's a step towards self-compassion. I think people have a lot of very kind of, um, some people have a lot of very specific ideas about what self-compassion is because there are some step-by-step -step processes that we do. We do them, you know, we, either, we do the three steps in a row and it's just like this, but really self-compassion, if we're practicing it well, it's saturating everything we do. Our thinking, you know, our speech, of course, our body, speech, and mind, and, you know, also our, our behaviors. So the way that we act, the way that we respond, the way that we even preemptively care for ourselves, we can see that self-compassion. Um, and I think this idea that it actually is something that's always already here, you know, this is again that Dzogchen idea, but all is good, right? There's nothing that's hard here. There's things that need to be worked. And what are they worked with? Of course, our awareness, but also they're worked with our compassion. Nothing is unworkable. And that attitude, like my shoulders drop when I hear it, like, oh, nothing's unworkable. That's such deep self-compassion, right? Like everything is workable. We can make it work with our awareness, with our, our care. And what's so interesting to me in practice and also um, in teachings that I've received is the relationship between awareness and compassion. And not just like cultivate both their two wings, but like, no, they're this, they're like the whole bird um, and they're not separate. Um, and that when we are paying attention, so attention is one part of our awareness, right? Within a greater field of awareness, which includes focused attention, a lot of sensory experience, when we're really present and aware and our attention is kind of directed where we want it to be or we're intending it to be, it's a compassionate awareness. It's not like a, you know, judgment comes later, like whether good or bad, but just the very naked flavor of awareness is good. It's, it's kind. 
And then, you know, we get into self-criticism and negativity and judgment of ourselves and others. But that basic sense is so important and to really start kind of, again, testing it, you know, like that gold, like you're going to, is this true? Can I really feel a goodness in myself? Sometimes we choose the very hardest times to test that out. We're like, no, it's not true. Right now I'm really mad at myself and there's definitely nothing good there. I'm just mad. We'd have to scrape back a layer, you know, like, okay, what is the anger? Like, what is it doing? Okay, I'm angry because, you know, I dropped my glasses. I didn't pick them up. I dropped, I lost these glasses. I always do that. That's so hard. Like that's, you know, that's this amount of money. Don't need to be spending that. I need to save that. And we can start to kind of pull down the thread of care. Like, oh, like I just, I just care about this. It matters to me. And I'm angry because, you know, because it matters. Something important. Is there goodness even within that? You know, and last week, in the end of the book that we were reading, Angel Rinpoche, the author, suggests that in any difficult emotion, we can find these qualities of stillness, of silence, and warmth, and warmth being that fundamental quality of compassion. And so it's like it can be very dense, but we can kind of find within it. So I like that approach and attitude around compassion and self-compassion. It's not this thing we do separately that we're trying to like cultivate over here and then we'll put like a drop of it into other parts of our life. Like it really can be or should feel like it's interwoven with our, our entire being, our heart, our mind, and our body. There's also a really <laughs> important relationship between compassion and self-compassion. Self-compassion, like everything in our um, world, because we live under capitalism, can be quantified, commodified, and sold and made transactional. And we can forget that compassion and self-compassion are like these radical, transformative tools and experiences. Um, and when we look at, at self-compassion, especially if it becomes, you know, like self-care, which again, like all, I am so in support of self-care. I teach self-care. I, I so support it. And it can actually become a source of suffering <laughs> for us if we over-identify with, I need my self-care for me, as opposed to, I need it to show up more fully for the things in life that matter. So when it becomes that kind of like for me transaction, it perpetuates like a craving and aversion. I want these things to feel good. And I don't want those other, this is my self-care time. Like, no, right? And just creating any binary there. But our self-compassion, our ability to kind of, um, I think it's that famous Rumi quote, our, our task is to seek out and understand and maybe destroy everything in the way of our love, right? Self-compassion is really on that mission. Like, how can I get underneath? How can I dissemble? How can I take, you know, all the different threads and just untangle whatever is in between me and like resting in love, our natural state. And when we have that self-compassion, our ability to then share that with others, maybe needless to say, is so increased. You know, our self-compassion is like the direct bridge we need to travel over to really be compassionate to others. Strangely, we can be compassionate to others without self-compassion. Anyone ever had that experience? Like really good at compassion for others, not so good at the self. What's up with that? What's going on? It's, it's possible. It's not that sustainable. And it can kind of create this dynamic of, um, you know, we want to give, we want to give, it feels good, we like it, but we're not attending to ourselves, And so then we hit this wall of resentment, right? And we need boundaries, like, no, no, I'm giving too much, I got to push everybody out. Whereas when we're integrating at a clear level, almost this like self-calibration, you know, self-compassion as a attending to ourself at this subtle and um, caring level. Then we're not giving so much that we have to face resentment. We're not overgiving. Yeah. We're not accidentally giving when what we really want is to receive. Anybody do that? 
right? It's it's very um, usual. And depending on our, our family environment growing up, that might be the dynamic we learned. You know, to get love, I have to offer a lot. I don't just deserve love. Like, I deserve love in, you know, because I've contingently given love. So there's a lot we can find with these habits of being able to extend compassion to others, but not to ourselves, and and see where it... You know, like kind of where it needs an upgrade or an update to this time, to this to this um, era of what we're doing in our life and who we're wanting to become. With compassion, you know, the very first step, we are going to do a step-by-step process. The first step, and this is a, um, a step-by-step pro- process first that was written about and taught by Michelle McDonald and then later made much more popular by Tara Brock. So it's called RAIN, and the acronym is the recognize, allow, investigate, and then either nurture or not identify. And the recognize, this part is really tough, like recognize our own difficulty or suffering. The word suffering, a lot of folks, you know, especially if you work in settings where people have very blatant suffering, right? They're in physical pain, they don't have enough to eat, or their shelter is uncertain. It can be hard to say that, oh, I have suffering. But the discomfort or dissatisfaction, that's another way that it's defined. And those kind of recognizing, like, the difficulty that's actually there, and especially the difficulty we create. Um, One way Tarbrock talks about it that I like is the war we're kind of invisibly waging on ourself, you know, just this kind of battleground of our mind. Um, We're trying to get farther and push forward, and we end up becoming so harsh and self-critical on ourselves. And instead of when something difficult arises, you know, wrapping ourselves in care, we kind of like double down, like, oh, this, no, like this is bad or hard or wrong, or I got to fix this or do something about it. So I think that first part of recognizing, um, I'm curious from folks, you know, when you were thinking of what is the difficulty or challenge that is here, did anybody come up with like, I'm being hard on myself? Yeah, some folks like that's what's kind of hard to be with. Yeah. Does anybody here find it difficult to consider or imagine examples of self criticism? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That seems familiar. And I do think it's very helpful to talk about this, right? Recognizing the self criticism, it's vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Right, like just to have to recognize it is like quite exposing in a way. That's not the front we put forward, um, many of us. So I would love if we can, you know, with a spirit of we got to laugh because or else we'd cry. What is that self-criticism like? Like, what's the voice? Um, I love earlier, um, Jimmy said, I know that same voice that's criticizing me is criticizing others. Right, like that same tone, it's like that same voice. So anyone willing to share, what's that voice? You don't have to share the content, you could, you know, what kinds of things does it say? And what's that voice like? What's that self-critical voice like? Yes. Since you already fronted me off. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Um, It's a sneer. It's a real sneer. It's like, who the fuck do you think you are? Mm-hmm. And I can, and there's a snarl in the voice. Mm. There's a curl in my lip, and um, and yeah, it's it's the voice that's in my head about me and my shortcomings is the same voice that makes up shit about other people yeah. as I'm going through my day. Yeah. So I know it's not, it, 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 I mean, there's a part of me that, that, that knows it's definitely not real mm. for the folks that I encounter throughout the day. Mm. Cause I don't, most of them, I don't know well enough to have any opinion about them one way or the other. And so I have a feeling that 
a lot of it that gets directed at me is is likewise um, not necessarily valid. Hmm. It's it's way less so in the last several years than it used to be. Um, and I try to remember when I, I do have difficult, there are, diff there are areas of my life that are difficult and that I feel I'm not handling as well as I'd like to. And, um, but there, there, being critical of myself for that isn't helpful. Yeah. It, 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 it has a tendency to make me deny that shit and to shy away from it mm. and not want to deal with it. And I'm learning or I have known that it's, it's, it's what's helpful is to really dive into it. And with, without paying too much attention to that critical voice, but dive into what's really going on. Okay. Yeah. What's below that. What's below that. Yeah. What's below that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to hear. I, my critical voice is not a sneer. It's like a different quality. It's it's a little bit of this like, yeah, I mean, we already knew you were kind of fucking up, right? This proves it, right? Like, see, yeah, which I guess it maybe is a sneer. It feels like a little bit more, um, but I think there's a little bit more sadness with it too. Like, this is confirming. See, you're never going to, you're not, da, 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 you know, just the quality of that voice. And um, yeah, you know, you, you hear this all the time when people say that if anyone talked to me the way that I talked to myself in my head, they would be like, I'd put them in jail, right? I'd get a restraining order, right? It's like <laughs> violence, right? It's abuse. Um, and yet there's, it's really, it's insidious. It's so there. Oh, Jason, yeah. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, chime in about, yes, sneer and snarl. I wanted to add growl. Because mm. the voice I, I hear is under the breath, growl saying, no, you don't deserve that. You know, this mm. sort of non, like, uh-uh, no, you yeah. won't either. You know, sort of like really undermining, telling me that uh, I don't deserve whatever it is I'm kind of trying to get or do or, and it's, it's very, um, I would say parental. It's like I have a parent in my head that's growling at me. Yep. So anyway, I see some heads nodding here with that. Yeah, yeah, I've actually heard quite a lot when we, you know, when we look at that voice. Do we know that voice? Like, yes, we do. It's a familiar one, right? That person could be decades gone, but their voice remains, right? As kind of in our head in that way. Yeah. Yeah. This is thing, and I realize that. Here, voice. I just realized that I talk shit to myself only in Spanish. I don't know why. <laughs> and maybe because it's like it sounds, I believe it sounds more beautiful. We can say so much more nasty things in Spanish. And I'm just like, and I was just like, why, why do I always hear it in Spanish? And mm -hmm. maybe because my parents are never like, you know, tell me, you know, but, um, but I was just like, <laughs> see, but it was supposed to be, ah, que pendejo. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I've actually been thinking about this a good bit lately, and um, I think I have two critical voices. Mm. The one that's there 95% of the time is almost emotionless, and it's mm. just like, it's keeping me online. Mm -hmm. it's like, mm, you, you know, it's just kind of like, do this, pay more attention to that, take mm. care of this, and it's kind of like like bumpers at the at the bowling alley, okay. the ball from going, yeah. going out. And, but the one it's, what it's doing is protecting me from mm -hmm. this one that pops up 5% of the time, 
that's the screaming mm. raging really evil one yes and um you it was interesting that you brought up um at the very beginning how did you feel when you woke up in the morning um the last two nights my brain has thrown fears at me in my sleep and uh not this morning but the morning before I had a dream about this imaginary boss that was just ripping me apart and oh. shaming me in front of everyone. Like this boss that I don't have at work. <laughs> but it's, you know, it, yeah. it was that voice. It yeah. was the one that's just like wow. cutting me, no slack, just yeah. like, shame, 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 shame. Yeah. And it's the 95% critical voice that's keeping me, protecting me, keeping yeah. me in line. Is, is the bumper voice like the taskmaster? It sounds like, is it, is it, kind or it's just kind of clear or it's almost emotionless it's, it's interesting just like, take care of that or it's and it's uh like you know recently i've been paying attention to this idea of right speech mm -hmm. and so i'm in a meeting today and we're talking personnel stuff and we're having to talk about some um team members that are having some issues with and the whole time i'm talking about somebody and the 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 guiding voice or the bumper voice is just like are you speaking kindly about mm -hmm. them or coming from it's like it's narrating yeah, like, yeah. like yes keep it in line are yep. you doing this right <laughs> great yeah and i'm curious during if you know if this is something that resonates like during practice mm -hmm. does, he, does that voice come to kind of yeah i mean when i'm sitting um, and I've talked to another person about this a while uh, recently, where um, I came up with the term the narrator. Yeah. There, there's the voice that is no voice, it's just the present. It's hearing, it's feeling, it's sitting. And then there's the narrating voice that's saying, okay, you're feeling, you're sitting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah. And, and it's like this the split. And the the narrating voice is also trying to like, Okay, you can do this a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I think, you know, I've definitely experienced this in practice of like trying to figure out like as I'm redirecting myself back for the millionth time to breath or to whatever is the anchor, you know, what is the quality of that voice that's redirecting me? Who is that voice? How is that voice sound? And for a while I think I was like trying to get rid of the voice. Yeah. And what um my teacher said, and I've heard another teacher say now too, that kind of resonates is it's actually not a problem. Sometimes the narrator, as long as it doesn't become a fixation. And depending on what you're practicing, like if you want to be practicing Dzogchen or a more open spacious awareness, it will just fall away naturally without you trying to get rid of. <clears throat> but in the meantime, having like that little coaching in like, it's, it's your metacognition, right? It's your ability to be aware of your thoughts and feelings as they're arising. And it's actually something that can be helpful to strengthen. Um, but anything that at one point in time is helpful can then become an impediment. So just to be like careful with it. Um, yeah. And it's so tender to know that voice and to have it in a, in a dream is really interesting to have it, have an embodied form. It reminds me of feeding your demons, which will be, is that next week? Woohoo! So just early plug, you know, giving, you know, a visualization to this voice that is so insidious, right? For many of us that we don't often think about it. Um, there's one other thing that you said I wanted to pick up on. Um, right speech. Uh, I think it's just such a beautiful term, just worth like unpacking for a moment of you know, developing a mindfulness where we're really paying attention to the quality, not only of what we're saying, which is important, but actually the inner speech too, right? And right sometimes gets people a little, they're like, what do you mean right as opposed to wrong, but more um, wholesome, skillful, helpful. Uh, and when we try to work on right speech, you know, in the outer world, that's hard enough. Like, can I be really saying things that are kind, even when someone like messes up? right, or does it wrong, or is, you know, um, not meeting our needs. But the hardest part of right speech is that inner speech, you know, that, you know, grimacing, growling, yelling, disparaging voice. Um, and it's, it's not impossible to start working with it 
where I have come to land, and I hope this is encouraging, <laughs> is that I'm not sure if getting rid of that kind of criticism, like that self-criticism, it happens so quick. I'm not sure if getting rid of it is something I can really aspire to at this moment but getting the distance between that critical voice and the self-compassion to be smaller feels very attainable. You know, I really see how like it arises and then very soon after it's like, oh, it's okay. Like, I love you. You're good. No problem. Like we'll get through. Because I think trying to get rid of the critical voice could feel very daunting. It does for me at least. Yeah. Is that Elizabeth online there? A hand? Nice to see you. <laughs> Hello. I'm going to get up there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I um, really um, wanted to to reflect that my, my voice is similar to yours. Um, and it's more exasperated. It's mm. more like, again... And like yeah. it's variations on this theme of like, you're so broken and you're never going to be fixed. And here's more evidence of just how broken you are. And, yeah. um, and what you were saying about the space between, um, I heard somewhere in, in a book, I think mind shift where somebody hmm. said, um, and this is something that I repeat to myself trying to jump in there is um, you're not a bad version of someone else. Hmm. You're the best version of you. Yeah. Very sweet. <laughs> uh, yeah. I find that just like really, you know, caring and, and sweet and something that like you would say to your friend or your child or your partner. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that that um, had come to mind was that I noticed that that uh, dread of the day that we were talking about earlier, that that sometimes will kick in the night before and contribute to insomnia. Like, right. like oh God, tomorrow is going to be like another bad day or I've got these things or just like even that mild dread that you start to like hook into and and build up and then like you try to self-talk yourself through that, but that's not actually what's going to solve it. Right. It's the compassion part. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I think, you know, it is interesting. The words like a, it could sound like an affirmation or it could just sound like a friend or a loved one. That's different than trying to think our way through it. Like you were saying, right. It's different than trying to, logically take on this voice, which is likely very old, right? I mean, I don't know if I remember a life before that voice, right? I, I know it has, it's grown up with me, right? I don't, um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Many iterations. Uh oh, I got real big, Cage. <laughs> scares me. I've used that uh, voice of self-criticism to succeed. Yes. So when it came to time to think of letting go, oh, oh um, I used self-criticism to succeed in life. And then there came a time when I thought of letting go and it's like, what's going to happen? Yeah. Am I not going to succeed anymore? You know, so. And what have you discovered? I've gotten more used to being wrong. Like I was almost never wrong because I almost never opened my mouth. <laughs> like I had to know I was right to say mm -hmm. something. And so getting used to being like, it's okay to be wrong. And yeah. actually mm -hmm. people like me better if I'm wrong. <laughs> so You're right. You're right. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I could like quote the research studies and evidence that self-compassion makes you a better leader, but like, it's way more interesting to hear, like just that noticing of like, wow, when I stopped being so critical, I took more risks. And as a result, there was this opening where people like me more. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Yeah. Is there time? Oh, yes, please okay. go for it. Um, and I guess mine's similar to what Kimberly just said. Um, 
mine my voice is i think it's interesting because i i recognize these as being parental and coming from like the way that people's parents spoke to them i had like this weird absence of parenting so i created my own mm -hmm. inner critical parent voice which actually is it sounds like it's very impatient and cold and sort of just like just just do this just just, just you know mm -hmm. just figure it out like figure it out right yeah very like do it now do it right like just figure it out if it's a problem but not only is it the voice that I use for myself, but for everyone else too. Mm -hmm. And like when we were going through our day today, like uh, I realized I spent probably two and a half hours of my day composing an email that I wanted, I was trying to solve a problem. Um, and the problem I was trying to solve is that someone else wasn't doing their job. So I was doing it for them mm -hmm. because, and so in my line of work, like if someone doesn't do their job, then someone can be hurt or lose out on like basic necessities. Yeah. So like this idea of like, just doing it, just, just do it, just solve the problem, like do it, mm -hmm. take it over, figure it out. Um, like kind of like what you just said like if I don't do that then people do not get what they need a lot of times mm -hmm. and so I just do it yeah so it is hard to let go and that's kind of like what I had endeavored to do like this kind of like this week like I came to this idea of like stepping back from doing that like pulling my energy back mm -hmm. um and I couldn't fucking do it today yeah yeah, and I think that's a really good point is it's not like we start to explore self-compassion and we let go of responsibility, right? So we still need to get shit done, right? And and so how do we like, and maybe like on wobbly legs, like get it done with some kindness? So it's, you know, in the same way that we think about, um, we we're talking about last week, like if we're hosting our emotional experience, from a body that's saturated with stillness and silence and warmth? Or are we hosting our experience from the pain body, the constricted, the diff you know? And so how do we, you know, same message that needs to get transmitted? Like how do we shift the way that we're transmitting it from? Um, and, and it is such a beautiful way with the self-compassion of like, what is, what is alive in me that's, you know, pissed off or hurt or, um, envy it, like what's in me that I need to really be with so that when I communicate, it can be clean, you know, just still getting it done. And it is tough because that self-critical voice it has definitely made me successful too. So it is a, it's a hard, it's a hard one to, um, to want to let go of but when we start to really take a full measure of the cost, mm -hmm. right? not only on us, but when we're caught up in self-criticism, we're not available for others, right? Even if we're like, God, I'm such a bad friend. I can't believe I haven't returned that text. We're not returning the text at that moment. You know, like we're ruminating on our bad friendedness, right? So like, how do we get motivated to really see the cost, um, which is a little tender. So good thing there's compassion for it. So let's do a little practice. If, if you want to just stand up and stretch, that's cool. Just reorient yourself. Again, really giving ourselves a little bit of time to find the posture that's supportive. Always important, but I think even more, especially with the self-compassion practice. Giving our body that signal of deep care.
And taking a couple breaths, really finding ourselves back to this inner gaze. Attending to and noticing the sensations in the body. And then taking a moment to shift our attention and awareness from the breath and the body to the mind and imagination. And we start with this first R of this RAIN practice, which is just the recognition of the harsh voice. One of the ways we sometimes show up in this stance of criticality towards ourselves. And see if we can be somewhat discerning and precise. Like, what is this voice like? What does it say? What are its qualities? And very often when we recognize this voice or this aspect of ourself, we probably just push it away, avoid or deny. So instead we take a moment and we just allow, allow the recognition of this voice, allow the recognition of the pain that this voice can cause. This isn't an invitation to let the voice criticize. It's just this simple gesture of accepting. Yeah, this is here. This is part of the way that I am in my own mind. Really notice what's it like to just allow instead of resist or avoid, push away. Part of this recognizing and allowing may help us see and start to take that full measure. What does this voice actually do for me, do to me, do to others? When we're getting now into the process of this investigation, this inquiry, what does it feel like in the body when we have this critical voice? What are the beliefs that we're perpetuating with this voice? Something about our not doing it right, not doing enough, never getting it. What are the beliefs that live within this voice? And this could feel a bit edgy, so no problem. Maybe <clears throat> allowing one hand to be across the chest. Just a simple gesture of the palm on the heart. And a palpable connection that we're here accompanying ourselves with this. Again, refreshing and almost as though it were the first time, what is this like in the body? 
this voice. And then we gently move towards this aspect of nourishing. If the hand is already on the heart, you can really have that sense of deep care. What would be the words you might say to someone if they were going through a difficult time? How might you treat yourself differently if it was this beloved person? You might say something really simple like, I love you, or I care for you. I want you to be free from inner harm. And again, <clears throat> noticing not only the words we can say, but is there a sense in the body? Can the body receive this? Are there places we can soften or open or soften or open some more to this and fundamental sense of caring towards this harsh voice instead of a desire to get rid of it? And then releasing the hand if it's on the heart. And we'll go through one more time. And just see if we can start feeling even more deeply the simplicity of these steps. Can we return to recognizing what is this voice? How does it sound to us? What is the impact of this voice on our day-to-day -day experience? And if there's something we're being hard on ourselves now about, can we bring that to the forefront? And then this simple allow, okay, this is here. This harsh voice, this criticism is happening. Making as much space as is needed to hold this. And again, freshly, what is this like in the body? Is there heaviness? Is there contraction? And what are the core beliefs of this stance towards ourself, this negativity? What was the message? And maybe even just realizing the message 
can ignite that sense of deep care and nourishing to ourselves. And more explicitly, really having a sense of this voice is not who I am. This voice is not everything. There's also care and love, compassion and kindness here. Feeling this very body as a body of compassion. Each breath as a breath of compassion. And feeling the heart and its immeasurable capacity to keep caring about our own suffering and, of course, others. And then releasing any explicit nourishing or investigating, allowing or recognizing and coming back to the body and the breath. And just being simple, just a simple being, following the breath, hosted in this field of compassion. Thank you for your practice. Your willingness. Would love to, um, yeah, make a little space for any reflections or questions on that practice. Thank you. Um, so that was a helpful um, one second. Um, so that was a helpful uh, internal system check. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, one thing that I was noticing is that um, I think my my own personal, like the self talk that I identify with tends to be pretty helpful and supportive mm. um but i notice that i sometimes remember 
or just feel affected by the way that others have spoken toward me, mm. you know? And, um, and so I feel like part of my own like employment of mindfulness, mm. um, it can be around just remembering that that's something that someone said a long time ago, mm. you know, but like, it doesn't have to have a ongoing, you know, sense of maybe that's true or questioning yeah. whether, you know, and so just, um, hmm. yeah, just a mindful acknowledgement that certain things have been said in the past by other people who mattered, you know, yeah. to some level, at some level, but that that's not something that needs to, yeah. So I think for me, like the self-compassion is around, um, I don't know, some, something around like, it's okay that it's taken me this long, like harboring all of that, you know, stuff, but like, so like some, some amount of patience with like yeah. letting those things go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's a really nice precisioning of some of these negative limiting self-beliefs are not even ours, right? They were like somebody else's that they projected onto us. And as you said, if they matter, <clears throat> then we often can take them on. And they might have been said like in an instant that person wouldn't even remember, but we're like, ooh, I'm going to try this on and wear this the rest of my life, you know? It's so, it, you know, that donated material, um, that like secondhand self-criticism. And, and I love this idea of patience. Like, yes, it's okay that it's taken my heart this long to not want to live in this anymore, actually. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. I was quite struck because in the conversation before the meditation, I was trying to figure out my, my non-self-compassionate voices and I came up with a bunch of stories and there was during the meditation, the experience of it was different than my kind of analysis mm -hmm. that I came up with. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because my I experienced it heavily during the meditation, but oh. not as a it's talking at me, but more as a I don't know. It's like walking down the street with a friend who's like constantly like just like one step ahead, just like dragging you along. Just like, I'm oh, going to this place and this place. You're like, mm -hmm. just, just freaking chill, you know? Yeah. And so it felt like, I don't know, I had this direct experience of the voice, not as talking to me, but more just like trying to be one step ahead. Mm -hmm. And the kind of the pressure that that feels like it yeah. puts on you. It's like, why are you trying to solve tomorrow morning's work meeting thing yeah. now? Like, don't just be here. Don't, don't be over yeah. there. Yeah. So even though it's not talking at me, its behavior is causing a lack of self-compassion. What did you come up with when you were curious about the belief that it's two holding? others, which I think are also true, which is similar to yours, a very highly useful but painful one that's just trying to make sure everything I do is correct mm. by doing the Doctor Strange, like figure out every, all the millions of possibilities that are not going to work. So you can have the one in a seven trillion that are going to work and only do anything once you've figured out all seven trillion. Yeah. Which takes a while. Yeah. And then there's the one that's more of the, um, I don't know, growing up and only got really, I had the, 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 the parental relationship where it's like, you have to have something that's like really wrong with you to really get attention. Mm. And so I feel like there was a voice that's always like, oh, let's find something that's wrong so that maybe we'll get some attention. Well, yeah. yeah. And that one is one that, man, I've been trying to turn that one off for decades now. <laughs> it's really annoying. Yeah. Um, so I think all of them were true, but I think they were different than the one that I experienced like in the moment. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I think, um, I certainly identify with the tyranny of the planning mind, you know, anybody else here, you know, like planning plan. And it's really, it's really, um, yeah, like vulnerable and tender to look at like, what is the belief of the planning mind? And what I found for myself is like, this isn't safe. 
so if I do this and that, like there will be safety if I, you know, and then I can just be in compassion with that. Like, oh, you don't know you're safe, right? Um, and you know, maybe I'll just say passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. Yeah, there's no safe passage. And this idea of trying to create safety on this, you know, on the uh, on the Four Noble Truths is like impossible, right? Like we can't. And so it keeps us busy and tied up for every, forever. Yeah. Yes. So there's some sort of process where this toxic smoke is generated and it's so awful that there's some part of me that says, I must pay attention to it, to all else. Like mm -hmm. that's the only thing in the room. Yeah. And, um, man. yeah. Yeah. Did you get any reprieve? Yeah, that's not the only thing in the room. And um and then I I went ahead with starting to read there's and then um start no uh time to lose. Yeah. And she had a wonderful suggestion mm -hmm. of making a little card, but I didn't do it with a stanza, but I was like at a low point and she I'm gonna I'm carrying this with me. This is just weather, it will pass. Hmm. This is not the fundamental state. Yeah. But somehow, you know, yeah. it's really hard. I just can't unwind that. It's yeah. like this policeman's inside me. Yeah. Law and it's like I don't need that anymore. I don't yeah. need that anymore, but it bubbles up. It's toxic. Yeah. And it's mm. more like a feeling. And then, then the then it comes, then it gets a theme, and then I'm with that theme for several days. Yeah. And it's like it's like a um, a burr that's stuck in your sweater. Yeah. Well, I love your dedication, <laughs> truly, and I think it's um, you know I think being gentle with how long it takes, right? Like decades to turn off that vigilant alarm or. Um, recognizing that we're getting dragged around by these ruminations and and old ideas, and we can be compassionate right there with it. With the breathing. Yeah. yeah. Diaphragmatic breath. breath. Yeah. On my stomach, mm -hmm. my heart. Yeah. Try to switch the gear, or just being with that. Yeah. There's no. First of all, recognizing it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, my voice is like, oh, yeah, of course, you're not enough or mm -hmm. yeah, you're not lovable exactly as you are. You're right. And I'm like, okay, fine. Let's say that were true. And then I place my hand on my heart or, or I'll palm to palm. Yeah. Um, even if that were true, I got you. I'm right here. I love you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. And it may be true, but whatever. I'm going to show up and love myself. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be by my side. Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. Instead of trying to like fight, like, no, it's not true. See, because this person likes me and da, 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 da. it's like, no, even if that's true, I'm here with you anyway. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's, um, yeah, let's dedicate the merit and take a moment to really feel just the the potential and possibility of being here with ourselves fully whatever is here with us. And part of this practice and part of this work is recognizing we all are struggling with this. In different ways, to different degrees, of course, but recognizing that kind of common shared humanity of the difficult voice. And taking a moment and reflecting on whatever has been opened or tenderized, whatever might be an inspiration, considering that to be energy, considering that to be resource, to be valuable. And then we can place our hands together if it's comfortable at the heart as a symbol of offering this energy, this resource, this value. 
doing this work for the sake of all beings and dedicating our practice that all beings could be more free from inner and outer harm. All beings could know their true nature and goodness. That all beings could find freedom, liberation. All beings could be free. So beautiful. Thank you all so much. Um, some folks here know I'm doing a bit of traveling and we have like kind of an all-star set of teachers coming in to cover. It's gonna be pretty cool. Uh, we start off next week, as I mentioned, with the Feeding Your Demons practice. It's a visualization practice that allows you to work with difficult emotions. And then the next week we have Nicole Chase, some folks in the room know her she's an amazing um yogi she does a lot of sound meditation and um, works a lot with creativity i'm excited to see what she'll offer here she does amazing yoga nidra um, i think would be really sweet um, and then we have alejandro chaul who was mentioned who's um, a senior student of tenzin wangyal rinpoche who we just spent these last months reading his book um, I wonder if they're going to put that out on the Ling Mingcha site. It might get kind of busy in here, just as a thought. Um, but already kind of busy. Already kind of busy in here. He uh, he does these beautiful, um, yeah, calling in the elements practices and kind of like how to bring this materiality of all the elements into our breath. So the Tibetan yogas, and then Tenzin Choki. It's like a really great lineup. But I will really miss you all so very happy to be here with you 